Welcome to Drexel's NCLEX Excel Review Course for Pharmacology. My name is Magdalene Vasso. Uh, this morning we're going to go over some key components of pharmacology that are related and hopefully that you'll see on your NCLEX exam. If you have any questions throughout the review, please feel free to ask me. Okay. Um, when you look at studying medications for the NCLEX, you need to understand some things. Some of the fundamental things that you need to know are the drugs and how they work. Now, when you study drugs for different courses, you don't always memorize how drugs work or the, or the pharmacokinetics of medications. One of the things to keep in mind is that the liver is the most common site for metabolism. So one of the things that you're going to look for is that for most drugs, liver function is a priority, okay? Drugs taken orally go into the liver via the portal circulation before they enter the central circulation. Oral doses of drugs that are metabolized by the liver may have to be much higher than parenteral doses. And you understand that that's because of the absorption process, okay, how drugs are absorbed. Liver disease may increase or decrease the action of the drug depending on how it's metabolized in the body. When we think about infants, remember that infants have an immature liver so that infants have decreased ability to metabolize certain drugs due to immature liver function. In the elderly, they too have a decreased liver function. Because the liver is the most frequent site for metabolism of the drug, it is also a frequent site for damage which makes sense, right? If the liver is working to metabolize the drug, then that's going to be the site that's the most damaged. Drugs are um, excreted through the kidneys and decrease glomerular filtration rate. Drugs can affect metabolism of other drugs, okay? So th they can induce enzymes in the liver to cause faster metabolism. Do you remember from anatomy and physiology that cytochrome P450? A lot of your drugs that are metabolized through the cytochrome P450, we have to look at really closely. Um, an example of how drugs affect other drugs is that we can look at a drug like Coumadin is needed for, an increased dose of Coumadin is needed for patients taking phenobarbital because it's an enzyme inducer. Um, erythromycin is an enzyme inhibitor and can increase the levels of theophylline. So both clinically and testing-wise, you have to look at how drugs relate to each other for med administration, okay? When we think about excretion, most drugs are excreted via the kidneys, either unchanged or as a metabolite. If drugs are excreted unchanged, such as digoxin or potassium, it's imperative that the client have adequate renal function. So one of the key things that you're going to think about for your NCLEX exam, if an answer choice is looking at the liver or the kidney, there are two areas that you're going to zone in on, okay? If it's metabolized or excreted is where you might place some of your emphasis, okay? Think about the age two differences. Remember how we said infants have an immature liver? Well, they also have decreased in glomerular filtration rate. So what do you think is going to happen to infants who you give dosing to? If they don't filter it out, what's going to happen? It's going to stay. Very good. It's going to stay within the system, okay? Same thing with the elderly. If they have a decrease in glomerular filtration and you're giving a certain dose of a medication and I can't filter it out, what's going to happen to that as far as where the elderly is concerned, okay? It's going to increase. So when we think about signs and symptoms of toxicity, the two clients that you're most concerned about with drug toxicities are who? the infants and the elderly because of the whole idea with glomerular filtration. Some of the hormonal agents that we're going to talk about, mostly we're going to focus on anti-diabetic agents, some of the pituitary. Steroids is a big one because we use them so commonly. Thyroid, when we think about thyroid medications, hypo and hyperthyroidism, we looked at Synthroid, we're going to talk about it. Some of your female estrogens, progesterones, and um, oxytocin, okay? But we're going to focus primarily in the beginning on diabetic agents, okay? Types of insulin that are used, insulin analogs. When we think about insulin, we have to remember that insulin is normally produced in the beta cells in those islets of Langerhans in the pancreas, okay? How does insulin work, both, uh, you know, that we produce? It increases glucose transport across the muscle and fat cell membranes, OK? 
okay? Insulin is destroyed in the gastrointestinal tract. Um, it's administered by subcutaneous injection. IM injection is very painful, so it's given, it's given subcutaneously in its exogenous state. Insulin is given to persons with diabetes mellitus to replace the insulin they are not producing. It may also be added to TPN, or total potential nutrition, to assure the proper utilization of the glucose. Because remember, TPN, it's high in what? TPN is 80% glucose. So we might add insulin to that TPN to help the transport of that glucose into those tissues, and also to prevent that hypoglycemia that patients might see. When we look at types of insulins, here they are all listed for you. They're rapid-acting insulins. Um, insulin analogs are Lispro or Humalog, Aspart, Novolog. We really have to, if I have to tell you to put anything to memory as far as the kinetics of medications, I would say that you need to put to memory the um, pharmacokinetics or the peak onset and duration of your, of your insulins. One of the things with insulin analog is that its duration is three and a half to four and a half hours, that insulin analog. So it allows the client greater flexibility, control of dosing. It's usually used before meals, okay? Um, but let's move on to the endocrine insulins. I'm gonna go into the, each one of these insulins. Um, the indication for the insulin is type one diabetes and type two diabetes if they're not responsive to oral hypoglycemics and diet modification. Remember for type two diabetes, it's usually even in children that we're seeing it more frequently and it's usually related to obesity. So we can correct it with diet and exercise. Okay, guys, what we're gonna move on to next is medications used to treat the GI tract gastrointestinal tract medications. You can see there's multiple classes. You've learned about the histamine antagonists, the proton pump inhibitors, the GI anticholinergics, surfactants, the antacids, antidiurals, there's a lot of them. So we're gonna just hit the key points for each category, okay? The whole idea with the histamine H2 receptor antagonist is to decrease the acidity in the stomach by blocking the action of histamine. So it blocks the action of histamine. Histamine triggers gastric acid secretion. Histamine antagonists are used to prevent and treat peptic ulcer disease and for gastroesophageal reflux, okay? Some of the examples of these histamine antagonists are the, the, are the first one on the market, the prototype was cimetidine, tagamet, um, ritidine, which is Zantac, fentanamide, pepsid, and axid are different medications for these, okay? So they block the formation of the gastric acid. The adverse effects in nursing care related to these is that they can cause diarrhea, dizziness, confusion, drowsiness, headache. Confusion is a major side effect, especially in the elderly. So these, this class, those H2 blockers, especially tagamet, should be used very cautiously in the, elder, in the elderly. They can increase your liver function, so you have to monitor the patient's liver function test. Cimetidine should be taken with meals for best absorption, okay? If patients are taking an H2 blocker and an antacid, the, remember that the antacid decreases the absorption of the medication, so you have to space that medication. Anytime you give an antacid, you have to think about spacing it, okay? Um, smoking decreases the effect effectiveness of the histamine antagonist, so smoking is also contraindicated for these patients. Impotence can occur after a prolonged period of time on cimetidine, okay? Um, clients who are hypertensive on one H2 antagonist may um, not be, um, they might not have issues with another one, so they can usually be interchanged, so you have to look at them. 